Thank you very much, Rob. Um, what a privilege to be here and to be with you tonight. I've enjoyed the curry, and uh, it wasn't actually as, as uh, strong curry as we had been told it would be, but um, I enjoyed that. But also the fellowship with all of you. Um, I've had a chance to get to know um, Rob and um, Kevin and Fraser and a couple of the um, Bright Hope World people, and uh, it's been great to be able to fellowship with people who have the same uh, mind, same passion, passion for the gospel and a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's my privilege to be able to spend some time sharing with you um, tonight. Um, this is uh, my, my city. Um, I come from Christchurch. Um, I live here. Um, so I'm getting used to the weather and the, um, um, the feeling of being in Christchurch. Um, which, and you know what that's all about, you know, the unknowns about the, the aftershocks, but also the opportunities that um, Christchurch presents us uh, as we think about the future. So as, as we think about exceptional people tonight um, from the developing world, what I, I'd like to do is to um, ask us to pray and ask that God will open our hearts to hear from him. Um, I'll share some things, you know, that, are, that I'm passionate about, but I'm praying that God will speak to you and that he will help you see partnership um, from, from another perspective um, and that he will help you see things that he would like you to see and hear things that he would like you to hear. And that maybe this could um, be a, a significant point in your life as you think about partnership and your engagement and mission, um, you know, um, going forward. So let's just pray and, and ask the Lord to speak to us and the Holy Spirit will minister to us tonight. Father, we thank you that we are your body, uh, the body of Christ, and we thank you that you live in us by your spirit. And we thank you that you have called us to be your own people. What a privilege to be your exceptional people. Not because of anything we've done of our own, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask tonight that as we reflect on people that are made in your image, from the developing world, people are your, that are your church, that you'd open our hearts and our minds to hear from you things that you'd like us to hear. We ask that you will speak to us, that you'd encourage us, that you will challenge us, that you'd open the ears of understanding so that we may see how we can engage more meaningfully in the work of the gospel. Partner, partnership in the gospel that will truly honor you and glorify your name. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, um, as we look at this subject, one of the things that I've been very impressed with is, as I've, I've looked at the Bright Hope World website and I've spent some time talking with Rob is how, how much you value a Bright Hope World quality. So this subject of exceptional is not just one that is, you know, has come off from a theme that you like, but I, I think it's something that I believe that Bright Hope World represents, that you believe in uh, having exceptional engagement and exceptional partnerships. And so, one of the things that I've enjoyed um, as I've been talking with Rob is to be able to ask the questions about how you engage in, in mission and in your partnerships. And I feel that we're very much on the same page um, with where Bright World, Hope World is coming from. But for tonight, I want to lift you up, in a sense, to, a, to a, another level of thinking that will um, help you think about partnership in a new way. I'll be speaking from an African perspective. I'll be speaking from my own journey of being involved in partnership um, for the last 20 years, both within Africa, but also in the Western world. In my travels around the world, I've met a lot of people who have got different understandings of what partnership looks like. And so as I share this, I hope I, I share it with humility, but I also share it to help you just have a, some, a little window of understanding of where people from the developing world will be coming from. You may not necessarily share the same perspectives, you may think differently about some of the things I'm going to talk about, but I hope that you will appreciate um, the, the, some, some of the aspects I'm going to give you because it will, um, you're hearing a story from a different perspective. Um, and I hope that that will be something that you'll you find helpful in your reflection about partnership. So I guess if you think about partnership, I don't know what comes to mind when you think of the people that are on the screen. What comes to your mind when you look at that picture? I hope 
we are supposed to interact. This is not just a lie. It's like the Bible looks a bit like Jesus. It's all right. Anything else? They're all different cultures. Different cultures, yeah. All made in the image of God. Sorry? All made in the image of God. All made in the image of God, that's right. Young and old. Yep. Okay. So I put. How about that picture? That's a Kibera slum in Nairobi. Um, I used to live in the city of Nairobi. Um, I've lived there for many years and I've walked on those streets. Um, pictures may not be very clear for people like Emma at the back, but um, there is actually um, some, you know, I hope you can see some difference. Any, any comments from, from those photos? Actually, the same street. Um, that's actually a picture taken from the same street um, a little later. So, if you actually notice carefully, there's actually a remarkable difference between the first picture and the second one. Uh, you can see that um, they've actually paved the little, um, little um, drainage there, um, whereas the first picture doesn't have a, a paved drainage. You can see a few more people in the second one. Um, you can see some activity uh, in the second one and the first one. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess if you look in there, you can see some, some differences between the first and the second. But yes, overall, same poverty, huge need, no grass. <coughs> now it's interesting as we look at those pictures, and especially look at the slum, it's very easy to come away with a perspective we need to help, don't we? A lot of help is needed. Maybe if we poured some more money into that place, if we help people in that slum, they would live a better life. They would have some grass, they would have better houses and stuff like that. And it's often easy not to think of um, what the people that you see in that photo can give us. It doesn't feel like those people over there have anything to give us or there's anything we can learn from them, or they have any wealth um, in them. We don't, it's not matter we see there that we think, that is exceptional, that is amazing. I need that, do we? Not much from that picture. Well, as we think of partnership, let me take you to verse number 17, because that's some sort of perspective that um, David, um, being taken as one of the youngest of Jesse's family to go and fight Goliath, was feeling. And so was feeling maybe a sense of um, guilt or a sense of obligation to help David fight Goliath in First Samuel 17, a story you know very well. And um, in First Samuel 17, 38, um, we read the following words just before 38. So say to David, go and the Lord be with you. Go and fight Goliath. And he felt he needed to help. David, he thought he's got the tools and the skills and the resources needed to fight Goliath. He knows this stuff about war. So Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in this, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. And you know what happened. David gives up the resources, the gifts, the um, 
staff that Saul gives him to fight and says, this is not going to work. These models, I'm not, I can't use this. I'm not used to them. And he chooses five smooth stones to fight Goliath. An image of simplicity, an image of a different model of engagement. And that's what I like us to look at as we think of people in the developing world that I've had the privilege of working with for many years, both from Africa but now from New Zealand, working with most of these partnerships from this end. I'd like to share with us five smooth stones that I see that represent how exceptional the people in the developing world are. In a sense, I'd like us to share about what the people that you may be able to see right now from, from that picture, what they have that is actually absolutely exceptional. The five smooth stones. First of those is confidence. That guy over there is a friend of mine. We spent uh, time working together in uh, the same church, Nairobi Chapel, as pastors. We're the same age, um, and, and we knew each other from when we were kids. About six years ago, Nairobi Chapel decided, it's, it's, Nairobi Chapel actually grew up out of the Brethren movement from, from, from Kenya, uh, became an unknown denomination of church. Um, and Nairobi Chapel decided they were growing so fast, they asked, um, all their five associate pastors in one month to, to go out and plant a church. So they released their pastors to go and plant a church somewhere else in the city of Nairobi. Moredi, Pastor Moredi Wanjao, went and planted the Mabuno church six years ago. Church now has about 3,000 people, mainly people who are, are, are you know, unchurched that they have been able to bring. And um, in December last year, um, I spent some time with Moredi and I was asking him about how the church was doing. And he said, we're growing so fast, the, the property that we have uh, is not adequate for us anymore and we are struggling to keep the numbers in uh, because we just don't have a space and it's a rental space. We're believing God to buy a, a huge piece of property for the growth that we feel God is calling us to, to have. Uh, to be able to reach the people uh, in Nairobi. The target group for Mavuno Church is younger people, because as you may be aware, uh, the population of Africa is, is very, very young. In Kenya, 50% of the population is 15 years of age and below. 15 and below, 50%. So, Moradi's church is targeting younger people. Uh, they feel that that's the unreached group uh, that has often been ignored by a lot of the uh, traditional churches. So that's a study group. A lot of the people there will be between the age of 15 and 25. Who will be the majority of his, his congregation. And um, so he wants to reach people in the city of Nairobi and he's got high school ministry, ministry in the slums and all that. And um, so I asked him, you know, what's the vision? He said, well, we have identified a property, 35 acres in a very prime land in a new subdivision that's coming up. That's a place we feel God has called us to go to take by faith, feeling like Joshua, you know, sort of, you know, um, and, and the land. And uh, so I asked, you know, how are you going to do it? You know, you've got many young people in the church. How are you going to do it? He says, you know, it's going to cost. Now here are the struggling figures. It's going to cost seven million New Zealand dollars. Seven million New Zealand dollars just to buy the land. He says, uh, we believe that we can raise that money. And the way we will know it is we will trust, we will ask people to fast and pray. We will, we, will, we will trust God for this if, and we want to go and challenge the congregation to raise 1.2 $1. million, 1 million New Zealand dollars in the next four weeks. Because we have to pay a down payment of 1 million New Zealand dollars and then pay the rest slowly. Maybe get a bank loan or something like that. Uh, I'm in Kenya, I'm talking to him, I'm thinking, you know, you're crazy or what is it? But um, he, he, you know, I, I meet with him with the staff. I've gone to Mombasa, which is a, um, a, the coast of Kenya, on a resort, to talk with the staff and the leadership team about this. They all agreed that the sense God was calling them to do this. And, um, and so they embarked on the process of, of, of talking to the congregation about this. And um, about a month or two months ago, um, I, I got an email from him saying, we are thankful to God that we actually have exceeded uh, expectation. We were hoping to raise one million dollars within four weeks. We, we raised 1.3 million, either raised already or committed to so that they can make the down payment. 1.3 million dollars 
from a small church, one congregation in Nairobi, to buy a piece of property for vision. Now, it has not been a place I've been to around the world, especially in the West where we have a lot of resources and a lot of trust and investment, where people talk about what they feel God is calling them to do. And it's a vision of faith and confidence. I have just been amazed spending time with people who have absolutely nothing in the slums, who talk as if they own the world, the people in the slums. That is an exceptional gift that the people from the developing world offer, that they've got a perspective, not of themselves, or not of their resources, like David, those five smooth tunes, that God can use the little resources they have to achieve great results. That is a gift you get from the developing world. And even though I come from Kenya, I can tell you I've never stopped being amazed by the stories I've had from people like those. You can go and read Maguna Chat blog, you will see the story over there. It's just an incredible, exceptional story of faith and courage. Not that we can do it by our own strength, but they believe that God can do it. And they, they will spend overnight in prayer meetings asking God to speak to them and coming away with a sense of confidence of what God is calling them to do. You ask them, what is the strategy, what's the plan? They've got none, what are you talking about? They just wait for how God will provide. You know, one example I'd like to give you about my comparison between um, the, the whole thing about how you plan for activities and vision in the, um, in the model in the Western world and the model from the developing world is the example of hunting. I like going out hunting for wild goats in New Zealand, because I discovered uh, um, that is a, a really special, exceptional gift for me living in New Zealand, that is yet undiscovered by many people. Goat's meat is a delicacy in Africa. It's actually more expensive to buy goat meat in Kenya than pork, chicken, bacon. It's, it's, it's the most pricey piece of meat because people like it for barbecue, and yet I can get it for free in New Zealand. So I've been going out with my mate up in Nelson Lakes, I'm hunting um, for goat, wild goat in New Zealand, and this friend of mine, um, I've discovered some differences in the way we hunt. You see, the way he, I hunt is that I will take my gun and aim, and aim, now, and aim, and I will try and shoot something. Now, of course, I've got to New Zealand, I've got to make sure that I, I identify my target positively. <laughs> it's an important uh, part. But, uh, the, you know, so I have had to learn the, the, the New Zealand way of doing things. But if I was hunting in Kenya, you just pick up your, your normally you don't have guns, you're not allowed to have guns, but you take your arrow and basically throw. And hope that you aim and hope you hit something, you know. So you just throw your, <laughs> throw your arrow, your bow and arrow, and hope that you hit something. It's a very much sort of... Um, um, it's a way of hunting that is very much, doesn't involve a lot of strategy or planning or aiming. You just do it and hope you get something. My friend from Nelson that I've been hunting with will aim and aim and aim and because he has to positively identify his target, may end up actually not shooting. Because he's really wanted to do it right, you know what I mean? And before long, the target has moved. And so, every time, so we got, I got frustrated because he would, he would miss the target, he'll keep, the goats would keep moving and say, no, we missed, we made a, a couple of goats, give me the gun, you know? I want to do it the African way. <laughs> I think that's the same way in terms of vision, you know? Sometimes I found um, in, in, in the West, we, we, because we want to strategize, we strategize, we meet, we've got all these meetings and these committees and we organize and everybody has to be on board and uh, we've got to have a process of planning that helps us know we're going to go. Where is faith? Where is vision? Where is courage? Where is confidence? I think that's a gift that God has given the developing world people. The gift of confidence. And it may look sometimes like flying a kite or being overambitious but it's a gift uh, of confidence. A confidence in a God who is able to provide and a confidence of um, uh, the exception of God who, who has amazing resources. It's a second gift um, that um, the people in the developing world provide. And that's a gift of community. We love community. Uh, Community comes as second nature for us. Relating with people from different cultures, from different tribes, from different walks of life, 
is like comes very naturally for us. And that's a gift. In fact, it's been said that one of the reasons why micro enterprise has succeeded a lot in the developing world is because of community. It is a lot of the majority of the micro enterprise organizations have have structured themselves around community. It's who you know. So it's a group of women who know one another, who've got friendships, who, who support one another um, in, in, in saving schemes and in, in getting alone together and they guarantee one another. And that's how micro enterprise succeeds. Uh, if you come to a place like Kenya, the, reason, the way people are investing because they have very little resources, they actually get together with their extended family and their friends and their neighbors and together, they create this pot and they raise money together because as a group, as a community, you have more power and more, you know, you have better equity than trying to um, invest on your own. That is a gift. It's an exceptional gift that I found. The way that people are able to think about one another and connect with each other. And it's not just connecting on one level. It is connecting at, at, at different levels. That is a um, picture you will probably not see very clearly, but it's in your notes, you'll be able to see it. But it's a cycle of life that shows um, the African rites of passage um, and, how, and, and the key events in life that are important. And in each of these crucial transitions of life, the older people connect with the younger people and they share wisdom you know, for example, if it's birth rights, you know, the, the children who are being born, the older women will go and teach the um, women um, who are just, you know, have got their newborns, um, how, how to bring up a child, naming ceremony. These are all critical points of life where the older people and the younger people come together to share experiences and to have rights of passage. And those are critical places. And that shows how the community is connected between the older people and the younger people. It's a gift. It is there in the church, it is there in the community, and it's been one of the things that has been um, used a lot in the developing world to be able to help share the wisdom of the old, older people to the next generation. Yes, in the cities we're losing a little bit of that, but it's a real gift that uh, there are clear markers of transition that, are, that people in life, um, there have. In New Zealand, one of the things that uh, we, we've, we've been trying to discuss with our daughters, especially the older one who is moving into teenage uh, soon, is, is those markers because uh, you know, where are they? How do you help um, young people in New Zealand to transition from being, you know, um, children to teenagers, from teenagers to the next life, you know, driving, getting a driving license, uh, and drinking your first beer, you know, all those are things that um, have become sort of right of passage for New Zealand. In Africa, they are very clear markers, and, they, and the, the older generation is there to journey with the next generation. I believe that's a gift, um, that the African church, the people in the developing world could offer the world today in a context where, we, where we're living in very individualistically and, and where we don't share a lot between the generations. There is a third um, smooth storm of exceptional quality of the developing people, and that is the simple lifestyle. One of the stories that I've I've been amazed um, in hearing from time to time um, across Africa is the way people live so simply so that others can simply live. Um, the way people are able to give up a lot, living a life of contentment so that others can live. We've got a friend um, who we, we've been supporting from New Zealand who's been studying in Uganda and he's from Sudan. He comes from a part of Sudan that is, that is very, very insecure. He's got his family um, in, um, in, in Kampala, and he said um, last year that he felt God was calling them to go to back to Sudan and serve among his own people. And a lot of people told him, why are you going? Stay in Kampala, get a good job, you've got training, you've got a degree. He said, no, no, I'm going to go back and I'm going to live there. There was no guarantee of salary. His church, which is almost like a nomadic church because they keep moving because of the um, IRA um, uh, fighting in the area. He has no salary, no income, no guarantee of income, but he chose to go over there. I've been getting emails uh, from him, and it is a very, very difficult place to, to, to be and to live. Every time you get an email from him, he's not complaining. He is not complaining about how life is hard and how difficult it is. He is talking about the things that he feels God is calling him to do in the place. How he wants to train more people. 
because he sees a need. How he wants to empower some of the, some of the families so that they can take care of the orphans. And it's just an incredible, exceptional um, um, story of someone committed um, to the gospel and to living simply so that others can simply live. A life of suffering and, and a simple lifestyle. Uh, many people do not know, um, um, who engage in mission, do not always know what a simple lifestyle could look like because often we, we engage in mission from a context of safety and as soon as things look like they are unsafe, we disappear, you know, we, we, we head out, you know, we the pastors talk about evacuation and security, we've got all these procedures that are, they are right, it's good to have, I'm not saying that it's not right to have those things, but how can we learn what it would look like to actually um, engage in mission from a context of suffering and difficulty? How can we do that? Um, How can we get to the place where we can understand what the people who are serving in some of these countries um, that are very, you know, where they're suffering a lot, what they actually do need? Because it's very easy for us to prescribe the solutions to people who live in this context. Um, I learned, having worked in about nine countries in Africa for a number of years, that there is only one savior and I'm not him. Um, because I always felt like, you know, rescue mentality. I want, to, I want to rescue people. Yes, I have a heart for people. I want people to get out of their situation of poverty and difficulty. But I was shocked from time to time to discover that in most of those cases, God was at work before me. He knew what he wanted to do. And often the solutions that he came up with, God provided were very different from the ones God had provided. And the people themselves came up with some of those solutions that are amazing. So, um, it may be that they have, they have children rather than have, um, you know, um, four or five different places to live or different houses. They have children a different lifestyle so that they can be able to save money to help in another need or to have medical care. The way people who live in a simple way and, 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 and in this context come up with solutions for their own needs is very different from the way I would, I would look at it. And that's a gift. Um, the gift of contentment. Um, that some of these people have. Their father, they will not complain about weather, about heat, about um, not having grass, <laughs> about running water. They will not complain about these things. They will just simply um, accept their lot and be grateful for the little that they get. That's exceptional. The stories you have in your notes there are stories from um, people who uh, have come from very poor contexts. And I was involved in a, um, a movement called the Disciple Nations Alliance, or the Samaritan Strategy in Africa. And we found that the way that we would help people in poorer communities was not to give them resources from outside, was to actually help them discover what they had themselves in that community. And the key was not the lack of money. You know, none of the work I did across East Africa um, showed that if you poured more money in that community, that community would be different. Almost always, especially the work that we did in the slums, showed that the greatest poverty was not financial poverty, was a, was a poverty of the mindset. It was the people who had come from a context of poverty where they never felt that they could arise out of that situation. So that even if you poured money into that community, they would not be able to use those resources as well because they don't know a different way of living. And so changing the mindset, helping them to believe that they have dignity, that they are exceptional people, that they, are, that they are amazing people, and that God has given them something that they can offer, was a critical part of our training process. And those, you read those stories later, I don't have to go into them, but they are amazing stories of just people believing that God has given them resources that they can bless other people with. Not looking to uh, the West or some other place for the resources, but believing that they have something, even though they come from very poor communities, they have something to offer. It was people like in a refugee camp in Kakuma, in the northern part of Kenya. We went training people there, and um, we require every, the, the poor people who are being trained to pay their cost of training. Now, most organizations that do any training in the slums will provide everything for free. It doesn't work. If people value the training, they will pay for it, even if it's just um, 
uh, you know, something small that they, they can afford. We found the people in Kakuma, we thought we would change our model, we we'll got because we were talking to refugees who don't have any money, we will ask them not to give. They asked the question, how do you do training in other places? We said, you've got to pay your way and you've got to pay the facilitator's fee. So we've, we've flown from Nairobi on our small aircraft into the refugee camp. You know, we know we're going to be there for a couple of days and we're going to fly back to Nairobi and we're speaking to these poor refugees and we're telling them, you need to pay the cost of doing this training and pay for us who have come all this way to train you. And they said to us, why would we not do it? And they made an offering that covered more cost than any other amount of money we've ever received from the training we've done in the city of Nairobi among the executives. We, we were just, we were you know, we were, we were just, yeah, it was overwhelming. But I can tell you from that came a seed that was born, uh, a new minister was born, a church was planted in the refugee camp, they're just amazing discovery of what these people, these poor people, could do. Simple lifestyle suffering, producing a great harvest, as the Bible says, of thankfulness, overflowing with gratefulness. And the scriptures there, you know, Paul talking to the Macedonian churches, giving out of their poverty. There is enough analogy from scripture to show that when people give out of their poverty, they are blessed more. And it's not just you know, blessed in that sense of, you know, God has blessed them. There's actually a real blessing of multiplication that comes when people discover what they can really do, their dignity. The poor need a different mindset, and that's what I found is exceptional. When they discover who they are, they discover the dignity they have in God, um, the story is very, very different. So go read those stories, and I hope they will inspire you. Keep going here. Um, going back. Um, the fourth exceptional thing is the numbers. The youth, the numbers, the energy, the passion. A lot of people in the developing world, when you're talking about South America or Asia or Africa, you notice a trend in most of those places. You, know, you notice the numbers that are there. You know, I just get, get amazed when I travel to places like India to just hear about the numbers. You know, even Africa, some of the numbers I've given you, you know, you're thinking 3,000 people in six years, what are you talking about? They are just people, and plenty of people, you know. Um, one of the cultural shocks coming from Nairobi to New Zealand is that there are no people on the streets. Where are the people? There are people everywhere on the streets, in Nairobi and everywhere. But that's a gift. That's an exceptional gift God has given people in the developing world. And that, that is a gift for the gospel. The numbers of people that are there. Huge numbers of people that are worshipping, that are in church. The youth, the energy, the passion that is there. That is what God has given. Now, we may not see this as a major resource um, that God has given his kingdom. But I, I, I reckon it's a significant resource for God's kingdom. In fact, it was a World Bank that did a survey, a research about the, the sort of three major sources of, of capital. And they said that 59% of capital comes from human and social capital, 25% from the ground or natural resources, and 16% from manufactured capital or infrastructure. Now, a lot of Africans don't have the second and too much of the second and the third. We don't have too much of the manufactured capital. Uh, manufacturing industries in Africa are struggling. No wonder we, can, we cannot employ people in Kenya and employment is 60% because we don't have enough industry. So people say we are poor, so developing country. You know, once you reach a particular threshold, you become developed, you know. 25% from the ground, natural resources, well that's debatable because I, I think we have a huge uh, amount of natural resources and gas and, and stuff like that. But you can see 59% from human and social capital, the numbers of people. No wonder it costs about a tenth of the cost to make a phone call, a cell phone call, from Kenya than it costs in New Zealand. It is so cheap. I found broadband is cheaper in Kenya than in New Zealand. So who's developing here? <laughs> <laughs> the numbers. The numbers help you, you know, because there's leverage. You know, if you're a business person and you've got the numbers, it gives you leverage, which is great. So, no wonder a lot of companies, China, wants to go to Africa. They've got the numbers uh, to be able to uh, get, get, get the outcome that they're looking for. 
So their conclusion was, in, 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 in these terms, the wealthiest countries, uh, in the wealthiest countries, human capital accounts for three quarters of the producible forms of wealth. And so the developing world is wealthy from that sense. And I think this, this affects how we do partnership and how we do investments and how we do engagement because are we looking at, at financial resources, the main source of wealth and, and the main connecting point? Or are we looking at the human capital, the social capital that this partnership that we have already provide? And how would this shape how we do partnerships? Just an understanding of, of this fact. It means that for the wealthiest countries, human capital accounts for three quarters of the producible forms of wealth. Amazing um, uh, insight there from the World Bank. So the numbers, the youth, the energy that God has given, a gift, exceptional uh, gift that God has given people in the developing world. And faithfully, a fresh insight into God's word. The fact that all people in the developing world will, will take the scriptures, they will read it, and take God's word literally. The confidence in God's word. Um, a perspective of the scripture that helps them, that shapes their understanding of God and their world. And that, that we can learn from. I'm living in the West. Um, I've told the story before, but I find it um, um, helpful to, to share the story. Um, so if you've, if you've heard it before, just, just you know, f forgive me. But it's a story about missionaries who had served in the Congo for a number of years. And they had been there for decades and were wondering whether the African church was ready to take the mantle of leadership and uh, run the church uh, in Congo. And they, were, they couldn't quite figure out, because you know, as a missionary, you're always struggling with the, with the balance of, is it the right time for you to leave and, and, and allow the local people to take leadership, you know, or are you living too early, are you leaving them, leaving them in the rush? And it's not always very easy to tell a good balance. And, and so they decided to invite them, an anthropologist to come and figure out whether the Africans were ready to provide leadership to the church. And this anthropologist decided to put the elders of this uh, particular Christian community in, 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 a, in a place where he was, was going to ask them um, to um, read a, a particular passage of scripture and come back and report to the whole group. The missionaries, a couple of them were to meet separately and read the same passage. And, this was, and the story that he gave them was a story of Joseph in the scriptures, in Genesis. And he, he asked both groups, go and read the story of Joseph and come back and tell us what the main theme the main lesson of the story of Joseph is he wanted to make sure that the Africans can do proper exegesis and, and can actually be able to teach the Bible. That's an important way of learning whether they are ready to be able to take the mantle of leadership. So the groups met for a couple of minutes, they came back, and the missionaries reported and they said that the main truth, the main lesson from the story of Joseph is this. They said that what we learn is that no matter what happens to you, no matter what trouble you go through, God will always be with you. Do you think that's correct in the story of Joseph? Yes, he went through trouble, but was God with him? Absolutely. I think they were correct. The African leaders came back and they said, what the main lesson we pick from the story of Joseph is this. No matter what your family does to you, you must never forsake them. <laughs> Do you think they were correct? I think so. I mean, it's another major lesson from the story of Joseph. So they were both right. It's just an issue of perspective. The Africans, had, with their communal perspective, saw the value of the family and the community, and that was the main thing that they picked up from the scriptures. The missionaries, from the individualistic thinking, thought, well, it's God blessing me as an individual, and didn't sort of quite see the element of the family and the community as a major aspect of the lesson from the story. You know, the people in the developing world read scriptures and they see perspectives in scriptures that are, that are different and unique. And, and, and we would be poorer if we ignored the perspectives of the people, the exceptional people in the developing world bring. And I wonder how in our engagement of mission, in our discussion of partnership, how much we bring God's word and we ask God to speak to us from the scriptures, but from the perspective of the people in the developing world where we actually do not bring our own insights into the scriptures from our individualistic perspective, but we actually allow God's word to speak to us from the eyes of those who have come from the developing world. If we just allow space for that opportunity for reflection, 
I think we'll be amazed by the truth that will come out of the scriptures. I mean, almost every verse of the Bible, you know, can be read from different perspectives, and you can see different truths depending on how you read it. I believe that God's calling us to be able to begin to value some of these gifts um, that we get from the people in the developing world. Now, what I want to do now, have you share those five smooth stones, um, and you know, the confidence that we, we can get from the, from the community developing world, the, the sense of community, the value of connectedness of community, the simple lifestyle, and the, and the value of contentment um, when one is living such a simple life. Um, the numbers, the passion, the energy that the people in the developing world bring, and, and the freshness of God's word. How do we bring all this together to the place where we too, from the developing, developed world, have something to offer? There is something God has done to us. We've got gifts that God has given us. How do we bring these two together? So that together we can actually share in God's mission in a way that will enrich uh, one another. I thought that I will very quickly um, share um, the four elements of partnership from Paul's vision of partnership in the book of Philippians. And I'll just very quickly run through this because I think they highlight to us a model that is very helpful. So Philippians, uh, this is really just a summary um, of, of the book of Philippians from a partnership point of view. Many people believe, when you talk about partnership, people will think money. Rich people, poor people, what is going across, financial resources. But if you look at Philippians, very interesting, you'll find that Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about koinonia, or fellowship, or partnership in verse 4 and 5. He begins by thanking the Philippians for their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work, the work of the gospel in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. The partnership in the gospel, together, those in the developing world, those exceptional people that God will be talking about, and the exceptional people in the developed world have something to share in the gospel. The gospel must be the focus of our partnership. And if we make the gospel the central focus, we will appreciate the gifts that those in the developing world and those in the developed world will bring as we share together in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 12, um, another post theology of partnership uh, through the idea of the body shows that there is no organ of the body that, is, that should be ignored. In fact, those parts of the body that seem weak, maybe like those people we saw in the slums, Paul says they are indispensable. In a sense, Paul is saying we can't do without them. We can't hope to progress the gospel in the world today without the perspective of those exceptional people in the developing world and the perspectives they bring in how to share the gospel. No wonder the church is growing in leaps and bounds in some of these places. Their gospel methods may be different from the ones we employ here in New Zealand, but boy, they are working. God is at work. And so we can, we can learn from one another. Partnership in the gospel. Then Paul moves in chapter 2 of Philippians to talk about partnership in the spirit. Um, in, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, um, if any fellowship in the spirit, then if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. The fellowship here, the word Koinonia used again here, Koinonia in spirit, the, the, the um, Holy Spirit brings unity, oneness of heart and attitude and purpose, humility in service, the thinking of the other person, and that sense of oneness that we have in the Spirit. And, 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 and that God's call for us to really engage, not from a business, very much business kind of thing, you know, we're here, we're doing a project, one, two, three, four results, these are the outcomes we want, but a real fellowship in the Spirit, a real connection. Uh, where we are other centered, where we're really putting the other person before. Um, and, and that's not always easy to do because it's very easy for us to focus on the project and the thing we want to do and achieve in that project. Once it's, it's over, it's totally finished. And we lose the place of partnership and the fellowship and, and the real human connection, the fellowship in the spirit. Paul values that in chapter 2 and, and talks about the attitude, um, the other centered attitude. Um, like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, he talks about the suffering. 
the partnership um, in the context of suffering, um, chapter 3, verse 10. Um, and he, again, his fellowship, um, here he says, you know, koinonia, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Koinonia used to get here, becoming more like him in his death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. It's very easy for our projects and our partnership plans to be with the main goal of alleviating poverty and suffering. Now, while that is a very noble goal, where is the call to actually join the suffering and join the poverty and join the lack as part of partnership? How would that look like? Paul talks about, yeah, fellowship of, of sharing in his sufferings. The part so that I may know the power of his resurrection, becoming like him in his death, and so someone to attain the resurrection from the dead. One pastor in Rwanda during the, um, after the time of genocide, um, um, received an email from a church in some, you know, developed part of the world um, about the need to come and support them. Um, after the genocide, you know, so many, 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 you know, people killed in Rwanda. And, um, and this pastor said, you know, actually, uh, we, what, what we wanted was not the money. We did not need the money from you. What we wanted was you to come and be with us in our time of suffering. We wanted you to be with us, to share with us in our suffering and our struggles. And unfortunately, most of the people who could have shared in the suffering of these people left. They were not there to share in the suffering. Because we've got all these travel advisories, we who live in this country, you know, you've got to think about insurers and safety and everything. Where is the place of partnership in the context of suffering and need? Where the goal is not necessarily to remove those people from that suffering, but actually to join them and to journey with them in that suffering to discover what it is that God wants to do in that context. And finally, and only finally, the partnership in money. Money comes last in Pauline theology of partnership. It's the last chapter of Philippians. For goodness sake, why should it come first in our partnership engagement? Why should money come first? You know, I've had many conversations with people about different parts of the world and, you know, many times, even before I have had a chance to explain myself about the situation and the need and everything, even before they have had a chance to know what my name and where I come from, the question quickly comes, where would you get the money from? Where would the money come from? The money question comes too quickly, too fast. It spoils the partnership. When the, the issue of the dollars comes first. And, and so I encourage you, Bright Hope World, as you seek to engage in mission, in the excellent way that you do, that the gospel, the spirit, the journey together in those difficult suffering, needy places with those who lack and discovering the vision for the kingdom that God will have for you and them together. And then only finally, maybe the, the, some financial resources won't be exchanged will come in place. But God will show you how you can engage in these things. And remember, it's an issue of giving and receiving. Um, it is not a one-way street. And so I'm keeping asking that question and keeping it on the table. How can there be real partnership when there's no mutuality and reciprocity. When the people who have received do not feel that they've been given the opportunity to give back. We're talking about exceptional people. If we truly believe that the people we engage with over there are exceptional, then we will work much harder trying to figure out what those gifts, what those resources, what, those, what they bring on the table and to give them space to be able to share those resources and to have the humility to receive from those very unlikely places. May God help us. Thank you.